We saw that there are more than one way to define sobola functions on metric measure spaces, and we mentioned at least four or five different ones with different inclusions between them. And to me personally, the best way to learn and find out my way in such a uh, theory is to go back to its history and its linear, um, preferably um, monotone history. So the several functions, the first one was defined as we talk, mentioned by uh, Korevar and Schoen, and uh, the rest came pretty soon afterwards. So by the year 2000, pretty much all these definitions that we, we saw had appeared in literature. So for this video, I'm gonna uh, talk about the major uh, or fundamental papers where things were either defined or um, important contributions were made to uh, I, I understanding these and finding out the relationship between these different types of uh, classes of sub functions. And uh, this, I, I probably shouldn't even be mentioning this, of course, reflects my own biases. And uh, uh, of course, I, I must have omitted many, many important works. Uh, especially my goal wasn't to try to give the, the more recent modern advances in the theory, but rather really just the basics and definitions. So um, without further ado, let's begin with the work of Kurevar and Schoen from 1993. Um, the titles will be in bold in all cases and the years of publication or maybe preprints will appear here. So what happens in this paper is they want to define a notion of Sobolev maps for functions that go from nice domains. You can imagine this is a Euclidean or manifold domain but the target you want to have a, another manifold or later probably something that is not even a smooth remaining manifold for example it's a manifold with singularity you can think of such an object or um, a graph or just a metric measure space so what they achieve in this paper is to um, find a direct intrinsic approach to defining uh, the Sobolev space W1P of omega x, where x is just any metric measure space. Um, this is in, a little bit in a difference with what will follow, because in, in the remaining of these works, the goal is to define what it means for function from the metric space into the Euclidean R to be a Sobolev function. So we see that the domain is a metric space and the target is uh, the real line. But as, as we mentioned in the monograph by uh, from to 2015, um, they revised this definition so that uh, the definition given here uh, does actually give a notion of Sobolev spaces for such maps as well. And also then uh, we can compare this to, to the other Sobolev classes. Okay, so the next important work was by Piotr Haywash and the class of functions such defined were, are called Haywash Sobolev spaces. The paper is titled Sobolev spaces on an arbitrary metric space. Uh, it's published in 96, but uh, the, the, the published version already mentions that it was received and accepted in 94. This I mentioned because you see a paper in 1995, which is follow-up of that work, but published earlier, which happens with differences in time, pro time and processing of papers with different journals. But anyway, so what happens in this paper of Piotr Haywash this very famous fundamental paper is that we define Sobolev spaces on an arbitrary metric space equipped with a finite positive Borel measure, which is our uh, minimum assumptions to begin with. 
and then they uh, prove some embedding theorems. And finally, they say we apply the result to weighted sobo spaces with Mach and Haupt weight. These are the type of interesting metric measure spaces where you have Rn, you have the usual Euclidean metric or norm. But for the measure, instead of the Lebesgue measure, dx, you weight it with a suitable functions, which uh, with restrictions that make them in the class Mach and Haupt. And this is kind of a a testing ground for many different questions. So if you want to ask a very general question in a metric measure space, and uh, the case of Euclidean spaces is too trivial, you then go into this spaces and, and see if your question has an answer uh, in this case. So it's, it's kind of a toy example, uh, an interesting example that is not completely Euclidean, but also not uh, too far from that. And the whole paper is only 13 pages. So what happens in the paper from 1995 by Piotr Haywash and Pekka Koskela, the paper titled Sobolev meets Poincaré, typo I forgot to fix, um, which is only five pages long, is that they prove that a very weak form of Poincaré inequality implies the much stronger Sobolev Poincare inequality. So what is happening here is that remember for the Poincare you take the average of the function from the function and you integrate and this should be bounded by a constant uh, and then gradient of the function whatever you are using for gradient, high wash gradient or upper gradient by Poincare inequality you take average of the gradient and it should bound the average oscillation of the function. Now, by a very weak Poincare, we mean that we allow a dilation of the ball on this side. So there exists some lambda, there exists some C with these properties. That is the definition of having a weak Poincare. So what is a sobel of Poincare inequality? And I'm not liking this, this color is that you actually put a PQ instead of just one here. And these are either called QP Poincare inequalities or Sobolev Poincare inequalities. So, which if you have a QP, you can get one P, but uh, so that, that's why it, it, this implication is the stronger one. And also the interesting title of the papers, Sobolev meets Poincare. So Poincare came earlier, both historically, and also Poincare inequality is a bit weaker than Sobolev. And wait for uh, the follow-up to this paper, which has another surprise title. So um, fast forward in 1998, Johan Heinen and Pekka um published this very, again, fundamental paper about quasi-conformal maps between metric spaces. And uh, what you want to prove is that, well, you can define a quasi-conformal map for between any two metric spaces, but if you want to expect nice theorems, nice properties, so that, for example, being quasi-conformal implies, say, absolute continuity on many in the suitable sense, many path. If you expect such results to hold, you need some control over these spaces. And this control geometry, for example, is alpha circularity. And uh, the, mo the strongest properties that you expect for quasi-conformal happen under the assumption that you have one Poincare inequalities on these spaces. So a doubling measure, Poincare inequality, these are having these makes the spaces nicer, or let's say we control their geometry. Okay, so uh, again, a, an extract from the introduction says that this paper develops the foundations of the theory of quasi-conformal maps in metric spaces that satisfy certain bounds on their mass and geometry. We show that a quasi-conformal map between such spaces belongs to a Sobolev space of higher degree. So if you are quasi-conformal map with definition that is only metric, 
then you reply that it is actually a Sobolev function from which, for example, it follows that it, it is absolutely continuous on path. And at that point, remember, the only two spaces of that have been defined as so as Sobolev spaces is the Hybar Sobolev space and also Korevar Shoen Sobolev space. So 94 and 93. So this paper, of course, does a lot and is not really um, only interested in Sobolev theory. In this paper, upper gradients are introduced, which are called very weak gradients in that paper. And uh, the notion of loner spaces, which turns out to be also a very key notion with a very um, intimate connection to Poincaré inequality. Okay, so one year later comes out the paper of Cheeger about differentiability of Lipschitz functions on metric measure cases. So um, they prove a Rademacher theorem that a real valued Lipschitz functions are differentiable at almost every point. And uh, the assumptions on the metric spaces is that it has a one point cut and uh, the, me the measure is doubling. So in this paper, uh, Cheeger, as we mentioned in previous video, introduces his own version of what a Sobolev function is and what Sobolev spaces are. But already by then, the preprint by Nagisvari had come out, which uh, Cheeger references because um, he mentions that the space that Cheeger introduces is the same space that Sham Glingham introduces. And this space has become known as the Newtonian space. This was the N1P space, the largest among these inclusions of Sobolev classes with the high wash Sobolev being the smallest and this N1P being the largest. So this paper takes the notion of upper gradients from the work of Henion and Koskela and uses that to define Sobolev functions. One nice thing in this paper, one important theorem is that you do get a Banach space on, from many different definitions of Sobolev spaces lead to a Banach space and then the relationship between this definition of the and the Hayawash space as as I mentioned also there was the Cheeger space there so different kinds of this space is isometric to that or is isometrically embedded in that or proved which uh, effectively compares these different class of Sobolev spaces and uh, the main tool used in this paper is the notion of modular path families. For, for So for this space of N1P, having many rectifiable curves uh, between points is very important. And the moduli is a way of measuring um, quantitatively how much curves we have, or a way to say we have a negligible collection of curves in a space. Okay, so um, the follow-up to the 95 paper Sobolev meets Poincaré is Sobolev met Poincaré, the past tense. And uh, in this much longer paper, uh, many, many new results are proved by Koske Hayawash and Koskela. And some of the results in the paper Sobolev meets Poincaré were also expanded or the full proofs were given. So in that sense also, this paper uh, is the past of this one. Um, one thing about this paper that I like is it, it actually talks about the applications to PDEs and uh, um, many, many other areas. For example, uh, Karnakara theater spaces 
subelective equations, that's what I meant by PD, quasi-conformal mappings on Carnot groups, loner spaces introduced by Koskela and Heinonen and Koskela, and uh, even analysis on fractals. So after they compare and um, discuss different notions of sobo spaces, they, they extensively talk about their applications. So the aim of this paper is to present a unified approach to the theory of sobo spaces that covers the applications many of those areas. So, um, so previously individual works had appeared, for example, people had discussed quasi-conformal maps between Carnot groups or quasi-conformal maps between Heisenberg groups. And, uh, and, and from, from these works of especially Hayden and Koskela, it, it turned out that uh, uh, we can treat these with, with same tools. So that, that that's, that's, was the main motivation actually behind developing this abstract theory of sobel functions, upper gradients, loner spaces and whatnot. So, um, and the variety of different areas of application forces a very general setting. That's why uh, it is worth one's time and effort to talk about um, sobel spaces on general metric measure spaces. So it's uh, not just because one can generalize, but because really there is applications. Okay, so the next few, the next two items are actually not, uh, it, compared to the previous work, groundbreaking or new um, novel work. Uh, but uh, I included them here because, well, the whole list's idea is to give you references for where to begin to read on the literature. And these are very, very readable, uh, user-friendly, let's say, references. So Joa Heinonen's book, uh, not a too long book, goes over the basics and uh, cre recreates some of the proofs from the papers in a book format. It's very readable and with, with nice commentary. And then Piotr Haiwash's 2003 paper, which is 46 pa pages long, it has a kind of surveyish uh, feeling to it. There are definitely new results there. Um, as he says, it contains new results and new proofs sometimes. The, sometimes the new proofs were actually uh, very significant in this theory because um, there they, they would find they would find a proof that uses a, or, or rather does not use some structure that was previously assumed to be necessary or the only proofs that were known you were using some something some assumption on metric measure space and then this new proof discarded that and that was another way of uh, making progress in this area so um Piotr Haywash is uh, well known for writing very clearly and uh, patiently so for, with this paper especially he says that it was my intention to make this paper accessible to graduate students and researchers looking for an introduction to this material and uh, just reading the introduction of this paper uh, gives you uh, a confirmation of this 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 fact so and also i tried to make the paper as self-contained as possible so if you want to begin somewhere with uh, say basic knowledge of uh, uh, what metric spaces are, maybe definitions of Hausdorff measures, and uh, a little bit about rectifiable path, then this is definitely the place to go to. Um, he even has the, for the a, f a whole section just devoted to the theory of uh, path into metric spaces with this length defined as the total variation being finite. So, and the he proves all these, let's say, very well-known lemmas that uh, these paths have Lipschitz reparameterizations, they have arc length reparameterizations, um, things that uh, many, many uh, papers would just say as is basic knowledge, but he does take care of those. Okay, and uh, this paper by Keith and Zhang from 2008, the last one on my list, 
I included it here um, for two reasons. First of all, it is a very, very pivotal paper in the whole theory. And number two, it has a beautifully written introduction, uh, about seven pages. And just reading that introduction gives you a pretty good idea of um, where the theory was back then, until then, and uh, why the result and how the result contributes. Uh, I also like the math Signet review written by Jeremy Tyson about this paper and uh, rather than calling something from the the paper oh, which the title of the paper actually uh, captures basically what, what happens in the paper but the review says that this paper is a significant milestone in geometric analysis in metric measure spaces so the term geometric analysis is kind of a vague uh, combination. So for example, what is analysis in metric spaces versus geometric analysis? So people use these terms kind of interchangeably, but generally when they say analysis in metric spaces, they mean uh, Sobolev theory. Anyway, so it's a significant milestone in this theory which resolves a number of important outstanding problems. It, it greatly clarifies the axiomatic foundations for the theory of first order calculus in Sobolev spaces. The theory of, there's also another jargon for Sobolev spaces on metric measure spaces. So first order refers to the fact that we don't ever talk about more derivatives. Just the first derivative is always the case and it's um, not really uh, easy or possible to really go into higher order solo spaces in, in this general setting. Of course, under much more additional assumptions, it might it must be possible in different in, in particular contexts, but not in general. But anyway, so first order calculus, geometric analysis, analysis, all of these refer to uh, Sobolev theory on metric measure spaces. The, the other competing theory, which may not necessarily deal with theory of functions and sub functions, is geometric measure theory on uh, metric measure spaces. But these are, of course, in very good uh, and close uh, collaboration. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the review, the sorry, the introduction of this paper, as well as this review, in fact, by Jeremy Tyson, is also a good way of um, a, a good summary of what was, what had happened before 2008. And uh, the paper here is saying that what they proved there, which turns out to be very important, is that if you have a 1p Poincaré inequality on a space, p is bigger than that, then there exists some epsilon positive so that you do have 1p minus epsilon inequality which is called a self-improving property I remember that lowering this P is usually what we wish and desire increasing it is an immediate consequence of Hilder's inequality so in this paper under um, very minimal assumptions they prove that you basically always for free improve from any 1p Poincaré inequality to something a bit slightly stronger. And it has important uh, consequences for, for many stuff that use Poincaré inequality. Okay, so hopefully you find this list uh, motivating to probably go and check out your favorites. If I have... Um, omitted a, a key fundamental result please do point out in the comments and sorry for any work that i have um, not included so this is only really just for uh, the beginning and a basic introduction and the references to places to begin with so if you um, have any questions as usual please do put them in the comments and please uh, uh, consider subscribing to the channel so that I do know that 
you find this material useful. In the next video, I plan to uh, probably talk about some motivation, um, going into more details of why one cares about solar functions on such abstract spaces. And uh, yeah, so maybe we shouldn't rush it. My goal is to really um, take it slow and over time we will get to talk about more technical, more detailed things. But until then, have a great one and thanks.